Hey all, this is the lecture on 11.11 .11, Taylor polynomials. It's going to bleed into the Taylor series lectures. It's really kind of the same idea, a little more focused on how one uses this stuff. Um, almost everything you do with Taylor series, you're really doing with Taylor polynomials. And here's the big idea. Any function that you want near any particular point, you can approximate by a polynomial. That's the whole point. You can make that approximation as accurate as you like by adding more terms, by making it a higher order polynomial. And you can tell with Taylor's inequality how many terms you need to get the desired accuracy. And then anything you can do with polynomials, you can do approximately just as easily with any old crazy function. Derivatives, integrals, anything you do is easier on polynomials. Taylor's polynomials allow you to approximate everything by polynomials. So the rest of the lecture is just kind of illustrating some of the stuff you can do with this. So here's one start. All over probability, statistics, physics, one deals with what's called the Gaussian function or the normal curve, which is some multiple of e to the minus x squared. So first off, you can get the Taylor series of e to the minus x squared from the Taylor series of e to the x by plugging minus x squared in to the exact same um, series. So we get the sum e to the x is the sum of x to the k over k factorial. So e to the minus x squared is the sum of minus x squared to the k over k factorial. Rule of exponents tells you that's minus 1 to the k times x to the 2k over k factorial, which written out in the dot 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 language looks like that. And notice it's exactly this polynomial up here where you plug in minus x squared for x. Um, and then we're going to write it, remember, instead of dot, 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 we can write it as O of x to the next power. What that means is that that error by Taylor's inequality is bounded by m times the absolute value of x to the 11th divided by 11 factorial. To figure out what m is, is really hard. Like we could figure it out for e to the x, but to figure it out for e to the minus x squared, we'd need to take the first 11 derivatives of e to the minus x squared, that is miserable, and then bound that on whatever interval you're looking at. Um, but whatever you get, as long as x is bounded, as long as you're interested in a finite interval, there's some bound m. When you divide it by 11 factorial, you get some number k, absolute value of x to the 11th, which bounds the error. And the way you say that is an error that is bounded by the absolute values, a multiple of the absolute value of x to a power, you write as o of x to the 11th. Eep, sorry. The kind of thing you need to do with e to the minus x squared is integrated. There is no way to find an antiderivative of e to the minus x squared, so you use some kind of, uh, of um, numerical technique. One numerical technique, a new one that we have now learned, is you can just integrate the Taylor polynomial. Okay? Integral of 1 is x, integral of minus x squared is minus x cubed over 3, x to the fourth over 2, x to the fifth over 10. Right? This is easy integration. And then finally, remember O of x to the 11th is some bounded by some multiple of either plus or minus x to the 11th, depending on whenever x is positive. So if you integrate that, you get some multiple of plus or minus x to the 12th. Okay, so O of x to the 11th is O of x, the integral is O of x to the 12th. Because can think of this as something times x to the 11th. 
So it's something times x to the 12th over 12, which is something times x to the 12th. Okay, so if we now plug in 0.5 and 0 into all these terms, doesn't make sense to plug it in here, but you get that the integral is 0 0.46128062. That is our approximation to e to the minus x squared. Here, we cannot, because we cannot bound that bow of x to the 12th, too much work, we could in principle, um, we're not going to get a specific bound on the error. But a good rule of thumb is, if you're taking out the first few terms of the Taylor polynomial, and each is getting smaller, then the error is going to be as small or smaller than the last term. Okay, so the, these were all zero in the first five terms, so certainly the error will be. That's not anything precise, but it gives you a, a rule of thumb. Okay, so the idea here is you write the function as a polynomial plus O of x to the something, and then O of x to the something you basically treat as a number times x to the 11th. When you integrate it, that's how you integrate it. Differentiate it, that's how you differentiate it. If you multiply by x, x, O x to the 11th by x cubed, you would get O x to the 14th, and so on. And we saw that in the last of the 11.10 lectures. So here's another example. Sine of x, we know, is equal to the Taylor series minus 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. So that tells you for small x, sine of x is x, that's the n equals 0 term, minus x cubed over 6, that's what happens when you plug in n equals 1, plus higher order terms, O of x to the fourth. So what would be the Taylor polynomial for sine squared of x? How would you approximate sine squared of x by a polynomial? Well, you could work it out as a Taylor polynomial, or you can take this polynomial and square it. Okay, So now there are um, a bunch of terms here when I multiply x minus x cubed over 6 and o of x to the fourth times x minus x cubed over 6 plus o of x to the fourth, I'm going to get nine terms, x times minus x cubed over 6 is minus x to the fourth over 12, minus x cubed oh, over 6, sorry, um, minus x cubed over, let's fix that, Minus x cubed over 6 times x is also minus x to the 4th over 6. Minus x cubed over 6 minus x cubed over 6 is x to the 6 over 36. Um, and then here we get o of x to the 5th. When we multiply x times o of x to the 4th, same thing here. Uh, x cubed times something times x to the 4th is o of x to the 7th and o of x to the fourth times itself is o of x to the eighth. So we end up with x squared minus x to the fourth over three, because there are two of these terms. And then this is a mistake, that should be x to the sixth over 18. So we get a nice polynomial plus three o of x terms. But notice, um, x to the 6th is x, or x to the 6th over 18, is x over 18 times x to the 5th. And as long as x is bounded, that's also bounded by a multiple of x to the 5th. O of x to the 7th is some constant times x squared times x to the 5th. But if x is bounded, that's a multiple of x to the fifth. So higher powers of O can get absorbed into an O term. So this whole thing becomes x squared 
minus x cubed over x to the fourth over three plus x to the fifth. Okay, so that's the polynomial that approximates sine squared. We multiply two infinite polynomials to get an infinite polynomial, except we only dealt with the first couple of terms. And that's all kind of dubious, so let me just um, show you here. I won't go through it, but here we can do the Taylor series for sine squared of x. Here's sine squared x. Here's its first derivative, 2 sine x cosine x. Here's its second derivative. We use the product rule, so we get 2 sine x time, 2 derivative of sine x times cosine x plus 2 sine x times derivative of cosine x. And that works out to be uh, 2 co squared minus 2 sine squared. You take its derivative, and we get minus 8 sine cosine. Take its derivative, we get 8 sine squared minus 8 cosine squared. There's actually a pattern here that you could follow if you wanted. When you plug in the um, uh, x equals 0, so as to do the Maclaurin series for sine squared x, you get sine squared x equals 0 plus 0x zero plus 2 over 2x squared plus 0x cubed minus 8 over 24x to the fourth plus x to the fifth, which is the same polynomial. Okay, so squaring the polynomial, Taylor polynomial for sine of x, keeping careful track of the O term, gets you the same answer as finding the Taylor polynomial of sine squared x. And then finally, here's the graph of sine of x, sine squared of x, sorry. And here's the graph of x squared minus x to the fourth over four. It's quartic like that. And what you see is, I'm going to erase here because I think seeing how much they overlap is more valuable. What you see is that this is typical of Taylor polynomials. Near where we expanded it at zero, uh, the series, the approximation is astonishingly good. We have just got two terms, but it looks perfect from almost minus one to plus one. And then once it starts diverging, it's terrible, right? This does no good at approximating this. That's pretty typical. Okay, I want to show you one more example. Um, I don't know why this is. Uh, there we go. Um, it's not so much, sorry, but there's a typo there. Um, computation is not as a, or you don't use Taylor polynomials as much for computation as you do for keeping track of stuff, simplifying things. So a great principle of science is you keep making simplifying assumptions until you solve the problem, then stop. Don't make any more. So very, very, very often in your life, in your other classes, in your learning a new technique, or in your doing your own calculations, you're going to be doing a long calculation. And at some point, there's going to be a sine or a cosine or an e to the x or a log or, or some exotic um, uh, function defined by a differential equation that you're not going to be able to deal with, but you're going to know that some quantity stays close to some other quantity. If you're plucking a string, the height, you pull the string horizontally and you pluck it, you've changed its height very slightly, but you can treat that quantity as very small. And if x is very small or very close to some fixed value, then you can approximate the function by it's Taylor polynomial, often the first or second term is all you deal with as a function of that x. So let me show you how that goes. Um, I want you to imagine pushing a child on a swing. So here's the swing. The swing, if you pull it, it makes an angle theta with the ground. And here's your, here's the little kid. 
Um, and what happens when you let go? So when you let go, gravity is going to pull down with a force m times g, where the child weighs m, and g is the force of gravity. But of course, this, the chain keeps the child from falling down. It forces that motion to be kind of projected perpendicular to the um, chain. Let's say the chain is of length r. No, no, I think I called it l, sorry. And now notice that, um, sorry, this is angle theta, which means the actual force pushing the child forward is mg sine theta. And I'm going to put a minus sign because it's pushing in the opposite direction from theta. Okay, so that means that the system we're dealing with Um, the acceleration the child feels is going to be, um, if you work out the, the child's position on that circle around the center of the um, swing, as a function of theta, the acceleration ends up being r times the second derivative of theta with respect to t. So that tells us that mr, I guess I did call it r, didn't I? Um, times the second derivative of theta is equal to minus mg times sine theta. And these m's cancel, that's an error. So we get the second derivative of theta is equal to minus g over r times sine theta. And I think it's probably easier to change the name theta to x so you can see what this looks like. That's a great equation that describes the system and it's hopeless. We can't solve that equation. Okay? But here's what you can do. Theta, or now I've made it x, is small. When you pull a swing, you don't pull it 45 degrees. You pull it a few degrees. And swings are kind of an extreme, mostly pendulums. You're looking at like a pendulum clock or things like that, where the angle is very, very small. So if the angle is small, if theta is small, we can use the Taylor polynomial, Maclaurin polynomial really, sine of theta is equal to theta plus order theta squared. Theta squared, typo, is very small if theta is small. So we can approximate this system by the second derivative is equal to minus g over r times x. We know that system. That's the spring law, right? In a spring, x double prime equals minus constant times x. So a pendulum for small angles behaves like a spring with spring constant g over r. Um, right away that tells you what should be obvious, which is when you let go of that child, they're gonna oscillate back and forth, just like what a spring does when you let go of it. Um, and actually you can get more than that. You can completely solve the spring system. One of the things you find out is that no matter how far you pull a spring, the period of oscillation is the same, okay? That means no matter how far you pull the pendulum up or the period of oscillation is the same, which means that if you let it oscillate back and forth as its period slowly decreases because of friction, I'm sorry, as its distance that it goes decreases because of friction, its period will remain about the same. That's why people use pendulums for clocks. Pendulums, once you set that pendulum going, it will oscillate with a fixed period that only depends on the length, now I've changed r to the length, sorry, and g in this simple formula. Um, and uh, that is true when the angle is small. That's the kind of thinking that you do with Taylor series, Taylor polynomials. Notice all the infinite series stuff that we did that was so deep and complex is in the background. But as long as you're comfortable writing a bunch of O of theta squareds 
around and remembering what it means when you need to, you don't have to deal with the infinite series at all.